All right. Well, thank you, Derek. And thank you um, to all of you for joining us today. And uh, in particular, I want to thank actually before um, proceeding, I want to thank uh, Aya Chanda, who is uh, currently on retreat. I'm very happy to be able to do uh, my best to um, contribute to allow her to practice on, uh, um, yeah, on some time alone, on some, on developing samadhi. So I'm very happy that um, she has asked me to uh, share a bit of Dhamma with you all and practice together. And I'm also very happy that you're all supporting her to be, to take some time off and um, just focus on, on, on her own practice uh, for the benefit of herself and for all of us and all sentient beings. So whenever we practice, we do it for ourselves and others. So before we proceed, we can, um, actually we can just quiet down the mind a little bit and start with some meditation practice. So if you're not sitting already, uh, this time is, um, Great time to sit down, find a comfortable seated position. And we can take a few deep breaths, close our eyes. And relax the entire body from the top of the head to the tip of the toes. Releasing any point of tension that we might find in the body. Sending metta, loving kindness to any part that might be aching. And we can slowly lift our attention to the breath. Perhaps anchoring our attention to the tip of the nose if it's helpful. Or maybe keeping a wider, more ample angle. We can start observing in detail every in-breath and out-breath. Without forcing the breath, without wanting for the breath to be any different than what it's like. We instead just observe the breath. Cultivating awareness and mindfulness in every single moment.
observing the length of the breath, if it's long or short. Observing the depth of the breath, if it's coarse or subtle. We just stay with the breath and watch the breath as it changes in every moment. No in-breath, no out-breath are alike. Each moment is a new, wonderful moment. If thoughts appear in the mind, we can let them pass through the mind like clouds in the sky without grasping onto them, without pushing them away or trying to keep them here. We can let them pass by while keeping our mindfulness of the breath study. If we catch ourselves trying to control the breath, we can pay attention to how uncomfortable it feels to try to hold on to something. Then we can let go. And just observe the breath as it is. Whether it's pleasant or unpleasant, it doesn't matter. We're just here to learn from the breath, observe the breath. Not trying to alter the breath.
And the more we keep looking at the breath, holding our attention to the breath, the more our mind becomes still and peaceful. And the more the mind becomes still and peaceful, the more the mind becomes happy. So we can recollect how this happiness is always accessible to us. If only we put the right conditions in place. So we can wish for ourselves to always be happy. Always be healthy. Always be safe. May I be happy. May I be healthy. May I be safe. May I be free from suffering. May I be free from greed, hatred, and delusion. May I be happy. May I be healthy. May I be safe. Remembering to put a smile on our faces. Really wishing for ourselves to be happy. Really nourishing metta towards ourselves. and keep cultivating and growing this feeling of loving kindness in our hearts and minds. And we can extend it to all the people here tonight, practicing together. May we be happy. May we be healthy. May we be safe. May we be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May we always be happy.
free from greed, hatred, and delusion. Free from all the defilements. Free from doubt. Free from confusion. Free from agitation. Free from depression. Free from old age, sickness and death. May we be happy. May we be healthy. May we be safe. We can keep nourishing and growing our metta. Allowing it to flood our entire experience, our entire minds. And we can extend it to every sentient being, wishing for every sentient being to be happy. May all beings be happy. Human and non-human. in this world and in other worlds. Beings with bodies and beings without bodies. May all beings be happy. May all beings be healthy. May all beings be safe. May all beings have happy minds. May all beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all beings be free from greed, hatred, and delusion. Free from birth. Free from death. May all beings attain blissful supreme Nibbana for their benefit and the benefit of others.
May all beings be happy. And without letting go of this beautiful metta, this beautiful loving kindness, loving friendliness, we can keep our eyes closed for three more seconds. And then we can start slowly opening our eyes and come out of our formal meditation practice. Mm. Everything is always better when we do a bit of metta meditation. <laughs> so at this point, we can um, stretch our bodies if we need to and adjust our postures. Right. And we can start by paying homage to our original teacher, Shakyamuni Buddha, the reason why we're gathered here today. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Utam tam tam sangham namasami. So um, Derek asked me for a topic a few days ago <laughs> and I was like, oh, what, what can we talk about? <laughs> it's kind of difficult to decide a, a topic ahead of time um, for a talk. So then I was like, oh, I haven't spoken about the hierarchy in a while. <laughs> so here we are today um, with uh, this choice of topic that Something um, that, as a monastic, I actually contemplated a lot because um, there's uh, so many things that at the very beginning can be very confusing um, before our going forth, during our going forth, and after our going forth. <laughs> there's um, um, obviously we have to deal with our own minds of greed, hatred, and delusion, and our the other other people's minds of uh, greed, hatred, and delusion, and lots of different ways, interpretations um, of the Dhamma. So, um, you know, I will start by saying that, of course, you know, when we take a form as a, um, as a monastic, so whether it's a bhikkhu or a bhikkhuni, actually the name itself means essentially an alms mendicant. Um, so we are by definition um, homeless, we're by definition outcasts from society. Um, 
we're not concerned with worldly things. One of the daily recollections actually that the Buddha encourages us to, to do is, um, is to recollect uh, in the 10 recollections, the 10 daily recollections, I am no longer part of the social hierarchy. Um, so this is Vivanin Yamhi Aju Pagato Ti. Um, so this is usually translated in, in, in uh, different ways. I think uh, Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi uh, had something along the lines, I have entered upon a classless condition. Uh, here at Empty Cloud, um, actually Bhante Sudazo has translated it as I am no longer part of the social hierarchy, which I quite like as, um, as a definition, as a translation. Um, and I believe that in the Ajahn Chah books, um, they, the chanting books, they have the have it something along the lines of, um, I'm no longer part of the world or something like that. And I don't have any uh, worldly concerns um, or I shouldn't <laughs> anyway. Um, so, I have to say that it's such a beautiful recollection, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful, um, obviously, instruction of the Buddha to bring it to mind, to understand, to recollect our choices. Um, but there are sometimes different interpretations that we might have on what exactly this means. So normally, you know, the average Westerner, myself included, um, you know, when we hear such things, such values, such ideas, we tend to equate this to a sort of horizontal structure, right? So, um, you know, similar to perhaps even an intentional community, you enter the Sangha and it's, uh, and you're expecting somewhat like maybe perhaps like a little bit of a hippie <laughs> commune where we're all on the same level and we're all like, you know, um, obviously it's a religious setting, but on the other hand, we're all, you know, uh, living together and perhaps having the kind of like the same status, etc. Everybody, perhaps we have the the assumption that everyone has the same say in things, the same role, and so forth. And um, of course, then we also have different assumptions um, if perhaps we've encountered the teachings of anatta of the Buddha. Uh, so the teachings of no self. Then we're also expecting that. Um, perhaps gender and sex have, um, they don't really make much of a difference, right, in, the, in, the, in these communities. Um, so we have perhaps all sorts of different expectations that might, you know, be a little bit different um, between East, West, uh, between age groups, between uh, gender, between so many different factors, right? Uh, but regardless, you know, when we enter traditional Buddhism, uh, perhaps if we have these uh, sort of ideas of a kind of more horizontal society, we can be a little bit, um, a bit shocked, <laughs> right? It can be a little bit, um, maybe we can perceive it as a bit in contradiction uh, with um, the horizontal concept of the Dhamma that we have in our minds. Um, for example, of course, there is the reverence and deference uh, that the lay community usually has towards the Sangha. Um, I remember the first time, actually, I wasn't a monastic, but I was a lay person, and I went to a Sri Lankan temple, and I remember, um, actually, I was there with, uh, with Bhante Sudaso and um, visiting Bhante Sudaso back then, who was living at the Sri Lankan temple, and at a certain point, uh, this um, gentleman came in, and he kissed his feet, and I was shocked. <laughs> I was not expecting that. So I remember very like, what, what, what did that happen? <laughs> Why did this elderly man, um, he's significantly, you know, older than Bhante Sudasa. Why did he kiss his feet? It's crazy. <laughs> Actually, my parents who are, on, on the other hand, 80 years old are currently now at Empty Cloud. And there is some lovely, um, people from Sri Lanka also, or from India actually, that uh, because they are my parents, um, they go and pay respects to them. So they bow and they uh, take all these beautiful forms and uh, they're very shocking to my parents. They're always like, why, why are they <laughs> bowing to me? I'm not the king, I'm not the queen. <laughs> what is going on? Um, so it can be a little bit shocking, right? If we're not from uh, those culture and we have these expectations, uh, we can be a little bit displaced or like, what, what's going on? And then there is also 
whether we're monastics or we're lay people and we see monastics interacting, we see also a lot of reverence and deference of the junior monastics towards the elder monastics, right? And uh, there's a lot of emphasis on seniority. And there is a, a, you know, a hierarchy, right, in, um, in Buddhism. Um, so we bow to seniors. Seniors usually don't bow to us. Um, in uh, there's reminders actually of seniority in every single Buddhist tradition in Mahayana actually apparently they have um, different numbers of patches uh, as the more senior the monastics become they they get extra patches <laughs> in Theravada we always have the kind of the same like sort of robe it doesn't really alter but um, I was told that, that that's also how you can tell actually even the differences between in Tibetan Buddhism, between um, a novice and um, a bhikkhu or a bhikkhuni, you can actually, if you start seeing um, the number of patches that they have on the robes and, and stuff, then you can, you, you have all these cues. And I was like, oh, very, very, very interesting, right? And um, then, of course, there's all the different titles that there are in, in Buddhist countries. Uh, so, yeah, in the um, Thai tradition alone, we have of course, Ajahn, then we have uh, Krubajan, then we have all the different titles that come with, within the Thai Sangha that I can't, uh, Chao Kun and so forth. <laughs> I'm not familiar too much with, with all the, the Thai ones, but there can be tons and tons and tons. And then of course, once again, in Mahayana and, and Vajrayana, uh, similarly, many, many, many different titles. Uh, if we start training in a particular environment as monastics um, for in some tradition actually monastics can't even say a word for years uh, that's um, quite standard actually and especially in Mahayana um, Zen in Zen Mahayana uh, environments uh, you're literally your duty is to shut up <laughs> be silent uh, for for many many years and definitely Regardless of traditions, usually, you know, we take dependence as monastics from a senior monastic. And so for, um, so we don't, we pretty much relinquish also our autonomy of decision making for definitely a period of time, definitely until we are um, on dependence with uh, our teacher, uh, from our teacher. But also if we, um, you know, we're, we finished our dependence and we keep on living in a community. Actually, even if we are the heads of the community, even if we are in a sort of abbot capacity or whatever kind of title that we, we want to define it, we are still not 100% autonomous. We're still not 100%. Um, we don't always have a say, right? Actually, in uh, some other communities, in uh, the Thich Nhat Hanh community, actually, the Sangha, they have the concept of actually flowing as a river. So over there, they won't even like the, the monastery, they won't even take sometimes um, decisions such as, should the monastery like purchase a <laughs> um, dishwasher or not? <laughs> well, it's not just a couple of folks that can make that decision. Everybody is, um, is there that has to say their, their say, which can make for really fun um, community meetings of hours of hours of hours of hours where it's like, no, I will, I don't want the dishwasher. I think we should get a dishwasher. <laughs> and until everybody's on the same page, they will not move forward. Um, so yeah, it's very different perhaps, right, than what we're used to. Um, in uh, usually forest monasteries, then you, you don't have a say of uh, what kind of furniture even you can have in your kvuti. So there can be a bit of a, a bit of a shock, right? <laughs> and, um, and then, of course, when it comes uh, to gender, of course, we find two different vinayas. So, of course, we take refuge in the sangha, but then the sangha has the uh, bhikkhu sangha and the bhikkhuni sangha. There are two vinayas, the bhikkhuni vinaya and the bhikkhu vinaya. And um, more often than not, there is a lot of segregation between the, the two genders. So, as I was navigating this, um, you know, this kind of like, all of these thoughts and these observations in my mind and kind of being a little bit confused of what is the Dhamma, what is not the Dhamma, what is a um, what is culture, what is not culture, etc. I started, you know, contemplating and looking for for answers um, in the in the suttas or or at least 
or maybe perhaps uh, more questions, looking more questions. <laughs> Sometimes you don't find answers, but we find more questions that um, make the practice a lot more interesting. Um, but also sometimes even different ways uh, that different types of ways of investigating the subject matter. Maybe we get some information on um, um, some of our biases that we didn't even know were there. And so, you know, I would say that first the, the a question that we would like to ask ourselves is, um, is there actually a hierarchy uh, within Buddhism um, in early Buddhism? Or is it a later development, for example? And how do we, mm, how, what is the most skillful way to relate to it? Should we accept it? Should we reject it all? Should we pick and choose what we like? <laughs> so I would like to invite you to uh, reflect on the instructions first and foremost of the, um, of the Buddha that tells us in the famous Kalama Sutta, um, not to believe in something just because someone tells us to, or because we heard it or even because a teacher told us as much. Um, in fact, in the Sandaka Sutta in Majjhima Nikaya 76, the, the Buddha um, tells us, advises us that if someone is a traditionalist, so if someone, um, I have a nice Sutta quote right here. Uh, the Buddha says um, to Sandaka, he says, Sandaka, here some teacher is a traditionalist, one who regards oral tradition as truth. He teaches a Dharma by oral tradition by legends handed down, by the authority of the collections. But when a teacher is a traditionalist, one who regards oral tradition as truth, some is well transmitted and some badly transmitted. Some is true and some is otherwise. In the Mahapadesa Sutta, Amutra Nikaya 4118, the Buddha also recommends to double chat double check the teachings that we're doubtful about so he says if when you are if when you check for them in the discourses and seek them in the discipline you find that they are not included among the discourses and are not to be seen in the discipline you should draw the conclusion surely this is not the word of the blessed one the arahant the perfectly enlightened one it has been badly learned by this monastic thus you should discard it so essentially what the Buddha is encouraging us to do is to investigate the Dhamma Vinaya, to find the answers in the Dhamma Vinaya. But it's important not to have an agenda, <laughs> but rather um, perhaps maybe another more skillful way uh, to approach this is to understand, um, if to ask ourselves the question, if there are these forms, what is the purpose of these forms? And also to understand what kind of agenda are we bringing to the table? And how is this agenda also kind of tainting our research? So perhaps maybe we have a bit of a um, democratic sort of agenda. So we are expecting to find answers that kind of prove that idea that we have, that pre-existing idea that we have. Or maybe we have um, an LGBTQ lens, or maybe we have a feminist lens, or maybe we have a sexist lens, or maybe we have you know, a very conservative lens, whatever it is that we, that we have. It's very important to, to kind of keep that in, um, into consideration, to be very objective about it and see and understand that it will influence to a certain degree our understanding of the Dhamma. And if we're trying to find those answers based on our kind of lenses, uh, we might be also very much disappointed <laughs> because we will find things that are in contradiction with those lenses. So my first question when I was... Um, uh, doing this research myself was uh, asking myself, what exactly does the Buddha mean by entering a castless con condition? So what does the Buddha mean with his uh, invitation? I am no longer part of the social hierarchy. And of course, historically, the Buddha was referring to the caste system in ancient India um, that was uh, had already been formed there. So with the Brahmins, the Katyas, the Vesas, the Suddhas, the Chandalas um, in the specific. But if one looks at other suttas, like in the Vasetta Sutta, it is clear that we can extend this to pretty much every class that we have in, in society. And um, that is fundamentally a convention that marks our living conditions. So the Buddha says that there is no inherent difference seen amongst humans in the Vasetta Sutta. Um, he says that we are 
a species no different than say snakes or birds or whatever, like a class of beings. And the differences that we see between um, each other, um, they're basically conventions. So he says, we're not born as humans. We're not born as hunters. We're a hunter because we hunt animals. We're not born killers. We act like a killer and there are therefore called as such. So in the Vesetta Sutta, actually, the Buddha is pretty clear that uh, in pretty much any class of beings, there's no differences that we can see based on uh, either color of the skin or based of based on genitals, um, based on all sorts of different um, classifications that we use, uh, but rather that also based on caste, of course, uh, but rather once again, that by action, we are um, defined to be one particular thing or the other. And of course, there's plenty of suttas where the Buddha talks about how kamma, um, so the, the actions that we've done, um, perhaps in previous lives, create the conditions, um, create the current conditions that uh, we've had as a rebirth. Um, but he also explains how those do not define our abilities to, to practice sila, samadhi, and panya. So that's very, very important. It's also very important that he essentially um, highlights how we're not inherently superior or inferior by birth, but by what we do. I love how he says, in fact, in the Vasita Sutta, uh, by action, one is a Brahmin, not by action, uh, not by birth, one is a Brahmin, but by action, one is a Brahmin. Um, because back then, of course, the Brahmin was um, the, the highest, actually still today um, in India, uh, the Brahmin caste was the superior caste and was the caste also that was considered pure, essentially. Um, so that, can't remember where it's coming from, which part of Brahma, <laughs> the Brahmin caste, I think, from, is it the mouth? I don't remember. Um, but point being, the, the idea was that um, a Brahmin was, a Brahmin by birth, so was someone who was pure by birth. And the Buddha instead was highlighting how instead one would uh, be pure depending on their actions. So we see also another thing that is very interesting that we see throughout the suttas is how uh, diverse the Buddhist Sangha is and how that diversity is praised in the suttas. In the um, Paharada Sutta, Anguttara Nikaya 819, uh, there are eight things, um, there's a list of eight things that monastics delight in Dhamma Vinaya. And one of them is, this is very beautiful, I love, uh, I love the suttas. <laughs> so it says, just as when the great rivers, the Ganges, the Yamuna, the Yachiravati, the Sarabhu and the Mahi reach the great ocean, they give up their former names and designations and are simply called the great ocean. So too, when members of the four social classes, the Kathiyas, the Brahmins, the Vissas, and Suttas go forth from the household life into homelessness in the Dhamma and discipline proclaimed by the Tathagata, they give up their former names and clans and are simply called ascetics following the Sakyan Son. This is the astounding and amazing quality that the monastics see in this Dhamma and discipline. So essentially, each one doesn't matter where they're coming from, what kind of birth they had uh, in this in this lifetime. They essentially become, um, they leave it all behind. They're no longer part of the social hierarchy. And all they are, are they're essentially the um, sons and daughters of the Buddha. This is also something that actually is um, elencated in one of the incredible qualities of the of the Sangha, of, um, of the contemplatives that uh, Rohini Teri in the Tirigata uh, enumerates. Um, so when she's questioned by her father, like the father is like, why are you so obsessed with all these contemplatives? <laughs> He's like, surely you're going to be one of, you're going to become one of these contemplatives. Um, He's also like, oh, they're all lazy, you know, there's these kind of parasites of society. Why are you so obsessed with them? And Rohini Teri replies with all these like beautiful lists of uh, qualities of the Sangha. And one of them is, uh, she says, monastics from different clans and from different provinces, they hold dear one another on account of this contemplatives are dear to me. 
Rohini Tevis is one of my favorite poems. And this is actually one of the most beautiful verses uh, in my mind, because essentially what she's saying is, and also what the Buddha was saying um, earlier in, uh, in the other sutta, in the Anguttara Nikaya, um, essentially as monastics, we care for each other for reasons that are not worldly. So usually we care for people because they're part of our family members or maybe they're people of our same status or the same nationality. Like we tend to relate to others based on the different identities that we have, different atas that we have, right? But instead in the Sangha, we come together sharing the Dhamma Vinaya, we come together as uh, sons and daughters of the Buddha. So it's something that is um, not a worldly <laughs> hierarchy, but something else. It's something, it's a higher value, right? And um, in Anguttara Nikaya 11 and 10, uh, the Buddha says, the Katya is the best among people for those whose standard is the clan. But one accomplished in true knowledge and conduct is best among devas and humans. So we say that the Buddha essentially, you know, uses a little pun. <laughs> so he says, of course, um, you know, for those of whom um, the caste essentially is, uh, is, uh, is the worldly value that they have of heart. That they say, yeah, the katya is a, is a really great um, human being. But instead in the Dhamma. Uh, what we're saying is um, the highest, the best person is one accomplished in true knowledge and conduct. So if we take the monastic form um, as a status, essentially the Buddha is saying, we'd better be a katya. Like, don't get this monastic <laughs> path. If you're looking for a career, you'd better be a katya. You'd better be a business person. Maybe it's the equivalent today. You'd better be out in society trying to get whatever kind of status you want to have in society. But if we follow the teachings of the Buddha, um, then we see that, for example, the monastic form, the purpose of the monastic form is not to have a privileged form. It's not a form of authority and power, but it's a vehicle for liberation. So ultimately, I would say that it's a responsibility. I like to say it's not a privilege, but rather it's a huge responsibility for one who wears it. The Buddha throughout the suttas, in fact, actually keeps on telling us how as monastics that basically we're eating alms food um, and living on donations um, and racking up a lot of debt. <laughs> <laughs> essentially until we are fully enlightened we are mm, i mean forget even uh, student loans uh, student loans are nothing in comparison to the <laughs> the amount of debt that monastics are racking up by being in this constant dependence uh, from lay people and um <laughs> Yeah, it's it's quite interesting how he uh, encourages us, in fact, to be the heirs of his dhamma, not of his material goods. In Bajwa Nikaya 3, in the Dhamma Dayada Sutta, one of my favorite suttas, he says that over and over again. How in, also in the Sanyutta Nikaya, there is an entire chapter uh, that is the Labasa Kara Samyutta on how praise, honor, gain are bitter, vile, obstructive for the attainment of awakening. So we see that um, in all of these teachings, essentially what the Buddha is telling us is that, um, yeah, everything that we're doing um, is, has to be, you know, essentially the standards is Dhamma Vinaya, but we can't also take Vinaya as a standard in and of itself, as a vehicle of liberation in and of itself, right? Like it, otherwise it becomes, if it's not drenched, with Dhamma, it becomes sila bhatta paramasa, no different than any other rites and ritual that we think that automatically will purify us. It's not that automatically, just because we are following certain precepts, we're automatically superior, but rather th these are gifts that are given to us by the Buddha in order to, to practice the Dhamma, to empower us the Dhamma. Um, you know, in my reflections, I was thinking at a certain point, I was like, okay, so we don't handle money, but also Queen Elizabeth, for example, I'm pretty sure, <laughs> has never touched any money, right? <laughs> 
So what's the difference between, <laughs> um, you know, practicing not handling money? What's the difference between a Bikoni not handling money and Queen Elizabeth? Is Queen Elizabeth actually like right there heading to enlightenment just like Bikonis are? <laughs> or is there a difference? And there's clearly a difference, of course, if we start observing it, if we start um, understanding it, because of course, not handling money is not the end itself, but rather it's a means to an end. It's a means to realize the Dhamma. And it is to support this noble quest that the Buddha encourages lay followers to support the monastic Sangha. And that's why to this day, people support and respect the robe. So of course, this can put us put us monastics in a tricky situation where greed, hatred, and delusion can overcome our minds, which is why the Buddha, once again, reminds us um, to be the heirs of his Dhamma, not of his material wealth. You know, good news is that if you're uh, a bhikkhuni, uh, you have less greed, honor, <laughs> um, sorry, uh, less um, praise, honor, and gain, so less obstructions in the path, so it's very great <laughs> for all of, all of those uh, women who are doubting monastic life, they're like, oh, it's harder, no, 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 it's actually much easier, because less obstacles um, in the path, but for real, it's very important, even for, um, for us bhikkhunis, for anyone who's practicing this path, to really fully understand um, why we have these precepts, and how and why uh, we can be supported by, by lay people, why they're supporting us, and depersonalize it, and put effort in pursuing enlightenment instead of entitlement, I would say. <laughs> so that's, that can be very, yeah, especially like the, the Dhamma has this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful taste. You know, it's so interesting. As soon as uh, one shares words of Dhamma, um, there can be some incredible reactions in, uh, in, in any person, whether they're Buddhist or not Buddhist. And usually they kind of associate that emotion to whoever is talking, but it's very important um, if we're monastics or lay people and we're actually speaking Dhamma and having those kind of um, effects, uh, how do you say, suscitating those effects in the, in the people who are listening to us. It's very important to remember that we're always plagiarizing the Buddha. <laughs> that this is not anything um, that is original from us, but actually this is original from the Buddha. This is an ancient tradition. And that we are in fact, yeah, the heirs of uh, the Buddha's Dhamma. And that out of, that it's not personal, that our duty here is to actually practice uh, the teachings of the Buddha. So I have a few other um, sutta quotes here um, where, I mean, I think overall uh, right now we were talking about essentially the purpose uh, of Dhamma Vinaya, right? So what is the purpose of, of Dhamma Vinaya? It's of course entitlement, not, sorry, enlightenment, not entitlement. <laughs> uh, right? So it's very important to, to remember that. And it's in this context, we see also how the Buddha says, um, explains the reasons why the good Dhamma continues or disappears after the Buddha's passing away. So in Anguttara Nikaya 6.40, Venerable Kimbala asks, what is the cause and reason why Bhante, the good Dhamma, does not continue long after a Tathagata has attained final Nibbana? And the Buddha replies, the bhikkhus bhikkhunis, male lay followers and female lay followers dwell without reverence and deference towards the teacher. They dwell without reverence and deference towards the Dhamma. They dwell without reverence and deference towards the Sangha. They dwell without reverence and deference towards the training. And they dwell without reverence and deference towards heedfulness. They dwell without reverence and deverence towards hospitality. This is the cause and reason why the good Dhamma does not continue long after Tathagata has attained final Nibbana. In another point, the Buddha also says, one who is competent and self-confident, learned, an expert on the Dhamma, practicing in accord with the Dhamma, is called an adornment of the Sangha. 
a bhikkhu accomplished in virtue, a learned bhikkhuni, a male lay follower endowed with faith, a female lay follower endowed with faith. These are the ones that adorn the Sangha. These are the Sangha's adornments. So in essence, what the Buddha is saying is that we're all responsible in cultivating reverence and deference to continue the legacy. So for lay people, of course, the Buddha is encouraging um, and not only in the, these suttas that I that I quoted, but throughout throughout the suttas, there's plenty of, of places where uh, he encourages um, to cultivate wholesome qualities in supporting the Sangha. In the gradual training, we see how Dhanakatam and Silakatam are essential to cultivate, to cultivate faith and um, right view. And here he says, I have a few quotes again. Um, what are the, the pros? What are we getting out of this as lay people? So he says, by revering and feeding the Sangha, one gets to cultivate virtue by making merit. And one creates the conditions for the Sangha to approach them. And one gets access to the Dhamma. When virtuous renounce, renunciants dwell in dependence on a village or a town, the people there generate much merit in three ways. By body, speech, and mind, he says in Anguttara Nikaya 346. Then in Anguttara Nikaya 5199, uh, he says, whenever virtuous monastics come to a home, the people there generate much merit on five grounds. He says, when people see virtuous monastics come to their home and they arouse hearts of confidence towards them, on that occasion, that family is practicing the way conducive to heaven. When people rise, pay homage, and offer a seat to virtuous monastic, in that way, the family is, pr is practicing the way conducive to high birth in high families. Then when people remove the stain of miserliness towards virtuous monastics, in, on that occasion, that family is practicing the way conducive to great influence. Then he says, when according to their means, people share what they have with virtuous monastics, on that occasion, that family is practicing the way conducive to great wealth. When people question virtuous monastics to come to their home, make inquiries about the teachings and listen to the Dhamma, on that occasion, that family is practicing the way conducive to great wisdom. And then he says, this is another beautiful in Anguttara Nikaya 538. He says, uh, when the good persons in the world show compassion, they first show compassion to the person with faith, not so to the person without faith. When they approach anyone, they approach the person with faith, not so much the person without faith. When they receive alms, they first receive alms from the person with faith. When they teach the Dhamma, they first teach the Dhamma to the person with faith. With the breakup of the body after death, a person with faith is, a, is reborn in a good destination in a heavenly world. So essentially, whenever lay people are practicing these uh, beautiful devotional ways of approaching the Sangha, it's first and foremost, for their benefit. So they're creating these attitudes of mind um, that essentially bring them to a good destination in this lifetime, but also in future lifetimes. So of course, anyone, whether we're monastics or lay people, we always want to be surrounded by really great, lovely, kind, nice um, people. And if someone instead is, gr is grumpy, is stingy, et cetera, we're kind of like, oh, maybe not so much, right? I don't really want to exactly hang out with, the, with that person. So obviously it's in our own interest to um, develop these beautiful qualities of the mind so that then we have more opportunities to be close to, to monastics um, that are more, more accomplished or anyone who's actually uh, ahead of us in the path. So it's essentially, um, a, um, how do you say, a, a, a exercise ground to create very beautiful, wholesome qualities of mind for, for our benefits so that we can access the Dhamma more and more. And for monastics, it's actually not different at all. So we need, of course, uh, as monastics, um, structures that are supportive to the development of faith in the triple gem and conditions to associate with the wise so that we can be taught by them. <laughs> so this is not like something that is optional, but it's actually something essential to the ultimate goal. In Anguttara Nikaya 521, um, the Buddha says, when a monastic is irreverent and undeferential and their behavior is uncongenial to his fellow monastics, it is impossible for them to fulfill the factor of proper conduct. 
without fulfilling the factor of proper, proper conduct, it is impossible for them to fulfill the factor of a trainee. Without fulfilling the factor of a trainee, it is impossible for them to fulfill virtuous behavior. Without fulfilling virtuous behavior, it is impossible for them to fulfill right view. Without fulfilling right view, it is impossible to them, for them to fulfill right concentration. So it's dependent origination right there. <laughs> without actually having any, without having a mind that has reverence and deference in their minds. We would, of, of course, have a mind that is instead arrogant and full of themselves, which is an obstacle to essentially um, train ourselves in that mind discipline. It's impossible then to essentially um, train ourselves in sila, samadhi, and panya. So we see how beautifully um, actually these forms are embedded within um, the Dhamma and the Vinaya to support us in the realization of awakening. This is also, by the way, there's in Anguttara Nikaya 579, uh, the Buddha says that in the future, there will be monastics who are undeveloped in body, virtuous behavior, mind, and wisdom. They will give full ordination to others, but will not be able to discipline them in the higher virtuous behavior, the higher mind, the higher wisdom. These pupils too will be undeveloped in body, virtuous behavior, mind, and wisdom. They in turn will give full ordination to others, but will not be able to discipline them in the higher virtuous behavior. Thus, monastics, through corruption of the Dhamma comes corruption of the discipline, and from corruption of the discipline comes corruption of the Dhamma. This is the first future peril as yet unarisen that will arise in the future. You should recognize it and make an effort to abandon it. So essentially, when we are also keeping up these forms, we're doing it for the welfare of others and for the preservation of the teachings. When this does not occur, we create the conditions for a Dhamma to seed and to flourish. So I just wanted to share <laughs> that um, essentially my understanding is that there, all the hierarchy that we see that has been um, brought to us through the tradition, of course, there is um, a lot of flourishment perhaps here and there, but mostly it's actually authentically there. It has been preserved authentically. It's embedded there in the, in the Dhamma Vinaya. And it's there though as a means to an end. So to help us nurture wholesome qualities of mind and to protect the Dhamma. So we use many conventions to define elders, right? Um, we are very obsessed, especially as monastics with the numbers of asas and so forth. But the Buddha is very clear that humility is actually to be practiced by the elders. And that one, he says, is a true elder when one has developed the qualities in the path. So we keep all of this. Um, we should hold all of these forms, all of these forms, uh, hierarchical forms, as forms um, that help us along the path, help us to create uh, once again, beautiful, wholesome qualities of mind that are for the benefit of ourselves and others and that support us in the path and that help preserve the Dhamma. So it's not uh, to be taken as a kind of like Vatican structure that, okay, that person is superior to those others. And maybe if I become a monastic, then I will get a promotion after 10 years, I will become an Ajahn if I get into the, the Thai forest tradition. But before 10 years, I'm actually a completely useless being and, uh, and so forth. And then if I become a Mahatera, then it, there, is, there is that and, and whatever, or it's not really about that. And we see actually even when um, incredible monastics, actually when Ajahn Pasano was here uh, visiting us, Ajahn Pasano, for those who don't know, is, um, is a very senior monastic. He's about like 46, 47 vasas, something along, along those lines, uh, who was the founder uh, together with Ajahn Amaro of Abayagiri Monastery in the United States. And he's currently there uh, as a consulting elder. He's kind of retired from his abbot <laughs> position, but he still lives at Bayagiri. And he was, um, he visited Ampicloud Monastery last year uh, for about a week. 
and we went to visit Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi, uh, who is also very senior monastic. And he happens to be one vasa more senior to Ajahn Pasano, so either 47 or 48 vasa, something along those lines. And it was just so beautiful to see how happy Ajahn Pasano was to have finally the opportunity to pay respects to someone who was more senior than him. And it just delighted my mind to see him be, like rejoice in that opportunity because normally he does not have that opportunity. And I was thinking, how lovely that I actually have that opportunity most of the time <laughs> because most of the time I'm actually the most junior. So I was like, wow, I am like so lucky <laughs> to have this opportunity to, yeah, to pay respects to, to all my elders. And it's not about like even saying, oh, I'm better than this person or I'm worse than this person or I'm equal to this person, but it's rather, oh, how wonderful that I have this practice to uh, this opportunity to practice reverence and deference to, yeah, imbue my mind with all these beautiful qualities. So when we approach it in that way, then actually it becomes, yeah, this beautiful supportive um, practice rather than something that we're like, oh dreading <laughs> or oh, I can't wait till I am like 10 vasas or 20 vasas or 30 vasas well they will be bowing to me or look at those groups of people etc cetera, etc cetera. because that's actually then that's when we hold worldly values within Buddhism we're not holding the values um, of Dhamma Vinaya the values that the uh, that the Buddha has in has left uh, for us so anyway, so these are, I apologize for my, uh, <laughs> I have a bit of a problem speaking English today, so I hope it made sense. <laughs> and um, yeah, that's what you get with someone who's not born English, um, who's ESL. <laughs> sometimes I can speak, sometimes I can't. <laughs> So I hope uh, it made sense. And at this point, we can open it up and see if there is um, some questions or reflections or thoughts. And maybe if you have different interpretations of hierarchies in Buddhism, then what is your, your experience? <laughs> You're very kind, Derek. <laughs> Don't know about the perfect English or the great, but <laughs> very kind. Terry, yes. I think you need to unmute yourself. Uh, uh, yes, thank you for exploring this concept. Um, it was fascinating. Um, I, at this point, I'm visiting uh, a friend in Thailand who has taken robes. And she's gone off to the back of beyond, tiny, poor village in the northeast. And she's saying how the arms round in the morning is overwhelming to her in that it, although the villagers were showing her great respect, it gave her a great sense of humility and um gratitude that they could be so generous with such a such little that they had and it was quite um revealing yeah interesting it was thank you so much for sharing that terry yes absolutely um that's one of the blessings of um of monastic life and also the struggles it's very difficult sometimes actually um usually i like to joke since we're in a gender inclusive monastery at empty cloud um i like to joke that you know the <laughs> for us uh, female monastics joke but you know it's kind of like also true serious <laughs> for us monastics it's also female monastics it's a bit of a struggle also to receive um we need to do the practice of receiving more than giving <laughs> which is also a form of dana um so it can be very difficult on so many different levels but also so rewarding 
And um, there's so much to learn actually from all the brothers and sisters in Asia. I had the similar experience going to uh, Thailand and going on Amsterdam. It's actually, it's just so beautiful. And you learn so much the, the Dana Parami that um, also culturally, like the Buddhist, Buddhist cultures have embedded in, uh, you know, in everyone's bones <laughs> mm-hmm. so that every single person will, yeah, look forward to having the incredible opportunity to make merit. And it's just so beautiful and so inspiring and so, mm, so humbling to be the recipient of such generosity. And so then we see really also it brings true the, the teaching of the Buddha being the hair of my Dhamma, not of my material goods of like, wow, why are, you know, the people uh, supporting me, especially in a Buddhist country for me, it was very powerful because it also mm-hmm. means so much. This form means so much for, for people there. So this respecting this form also um, has so many more implications than um, it can have in other places where people don't really quite know you, you're just someone wearing weird, odd clothes, right? <laughs> um, so yeah, it it's humbling, uh, very can also be a little bit stressful because <laughs> once again, if you do an act of bad karma as a lay person, it's mostly reflecting on yourself and um, you are the only one reaping the consequences. But if you're a monastic, you know, if you have this form and you're acting unskillfully, then it has so many repercussions and you risk also damaging the faith of so many people in the Sangha. So you have lots of extra bad karma <laughs> or extra good karma you know if um <laughs> if on the other hand you act correctly and properly but yeah thank you so much for for sharing that it is it is really beautiful you know all these forms that the buddha has has created and for to respond you know, the buddha is not trying to guilt trip us monastics mm-hmm. telling us you know you're in you're full of debt, <laughs> but it is a very good, good reminder because sometimes we can become entitled. We think that everything is mm-hmm. that's due to us, especially in Asia where people are so generous, but instead actually people work a lot, work very hard um, to, yeah, to support the Sangha. I will ask James to unmute. Great, James. Hello. Thank you for the Hello. talk. The, um, yeah, this, 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 uh, de- the deference part, it's sort of hard for people in the West, isn't it? It's um, not something we're entirely used to, I guess. Um, not a lot, anyway. I certainly find that um, if you look at sort of so-called secular Buddhism, it's certainly very much absent isn't it i think and i guess it's uh a serious loss i suppose i suppose one thing i wonder is that um obviously not everyone in the sangha is is perhaps worthy i mean not to be negative or anything but uh is is necessarily worthy of this so did the buddha leave any sort of like um some tips for want of a better word as to how they should be behaving to be worth. I mean, you know, say me, I say I'm visiting a monastery and I'm thinking to myself, well, is this place worthy of my my support, my deference? Um, you know, are these is this sangha worth worth bowing to? You know, so what would one look for? Thank you. Thank you so much, James. That's a very relatable question. <laughs> I feel like um, as convert Buddhists, we always struggle with that, right? We're like, okay, I really like to bow to Ajahn Pasano, but to that other, whatever, Ajahn over there, I don't think so. <laughs> or I like that monastic, but I don't like that monastic. Or yeah, we just personalize everything. Um, it's very interesting uh, in the in the suttas actually, we see um, Uga, the householder, is one of my my favorite suttas, where 
uh, if I remember correctly, he's a non-returner. And at a certain point, he's describing all his like amazing qualities. I love it. You know, in the suttas, the lay people are not shy of like saying, you know, how great they are. <laughs> like, these are my great, awesome qualities of mine. And, you know, in, in the list, actually, Uga, the householder says that um, even though... Uh, for example, he he speaks to devas, uh, and he also can like read the minds, so he can see the devas sometimes tell him, "Hey, that monastic actually is like his sila is terrible, or like his samadhi is awful, <laughs> or like he can read their minds and see actually oh, look at all those like horrible thoughts that those monastics have, and or that one is good, but the other one is is terrible, etc." And Uga says. But I actually give the same amount of food and the same dana to each one, just the same. This is one of my wonderful qualities. Then the other thing that comes up is um, that he's a non-returner once again. And he's like, oh, one of my great, wonderful qualities is that, you know, if there is a monastic that comes, first I see if like they have anything to, to if they want to share some words of dhamma with me. If they have nothing to say, then I will give them um, a Dhamma talk out of compassion. And I was like, wow, it's so incredible. He's a non-returner, right? So he has definitely a lot of, of teachings um, to give. So you might think, okay, there's a, you know, a worldling monastic, even though they have a robe <laughs> on, but they're not even a stream enter. And they approach uh, Uga, who's a householder, but um, a non-returner so clearly ahead of him in the path but Uga's mind state because he's a non-returner because he's someone advanced is not to say hey look at me like I'm so much better than you you're such a worldling of course I should be teaching you but rather it's to respect um, the sangha for the sake of the sangha and then out of compassion if the monastic has nothing to say they share um, they give he gives them a, a teaching, you know, to, to direct them, to point them in the right direction. I find it so inspiring, inspiring, so beautiful. Um, one, because it shows us the, the quality of humility that we want to generate in our minds. So our duty is instead to, um, our duty is always to practice reverence and deference. <laughs> And most of the time, we actually worry too much to do the, the job of other, other people, right? So we're like, oh, look at that guy, <laughs> or that bikuni there, or that bikuni over there, or that samanera, or that samaneri, or that other lay person, or that other, they should be doing X, Y, and Z, or that person is worthy, or that person is not worthy. So we are always constantly focusing on the job that other people are doing, but we're not focusing on our job. And also when we take the form as monastics, I have to say at the very beginning, you know, for me, it was terrifying, actually, to be quite frank, to receive offerings of any kind. Um, I had a really hard time. I loved very much being a lay person because I loved making offerings to the Sangha, but then receiving them, I was like, oh, I'm not worthy. Why are they, why are they offering me these things? I am terrible. I shouldn't be like, <laughs> um, you know, be the recipient of this, etc. And kind of like this imposter syndrome and all sorts of horrible thoughts appearing in the mind and then I remember at a certain point someone donated this Buddha statue it was um, a, a good friend from Burma and uh, she said thank you to me as she was giving me the the Buddha statue I remember going like what do you mean thank you like <laughs> you are giving me the offering so I should be saying thank you like I didn't word it that way but it was actually an incredible teaching that she gave me in that moment I realized she is not giving the Buddha statue to me because <laughs> yes, I am not worthy of that. I'm, you know, it's not, it's not about me. She's making an offering to the Sangha and she's thanking me because I am representing the Sangha. So I am allowing her to make an offering to the Sangha, but it has nothing to do with me. People are not giving me gifts. Um, so we're not it's not about the individual. It's about the Sangha. We take refuge in the Sangha, not in Ayasoma, or we make offerings uh, to the Sangha, not to Ayasoma, and so forth. And once I understood that, I stopped getting into the way. Now it's very, I'm always like Anumadana. I rejoice in the, in the generosity of people. I'm like, oh, how beautiful that they are making this. Um, 
beautiful practice of generosity. So that's why, you know, I always say that I have many teachers and they're not all monastics. Um, half of them are actually all lay people, usually born in, in Asia. I learned so much uh, from Buddhist born people. They have this kind of innate wisdom due to the, the culture that they they live in. So yeah, so all these forms are very inspiring to me, these um, incredible yeah, incredible dana paramis. So yeah, in that way, we're also practicing anatta. So it's not about us. It's not about our, our preference. Uh, it's not about our delusions, but rather it's all about the triple gem. We take refuge in the triple gem and we're practicing humility. It's actually like very humble, um, very big practice of humbleness, you know, to bow to monastics that we don't like, for example, <laughs> just because they're randomly like more senior than us. Um, or even if, yeah, if we're a lay person, maybe we are more educated than someone, but we still bow. So it's completely, I love how the Buddha, you know, just created this arbitrary way of like seniority. It doesn't matter. Like it can be yeah, uh, it's just one day before, one hour before, and you're just automatically senior. It has nothing to do with, um, yeah, how many books you've published uh, or <laughs> how many uh, things you've translated or how many jhanas you have acquired. Like, it has nothing to do with that. It's all about, yeah, it's just a convention and we respect the convention. So I hope that answered your question. Thank you. Anything else? We have a couple more minutes. Maybe the next uh, topic, since we will be talking, what was it? I think karma, karma and uh, female rebirth. How about, <laughs> We actually do maybe a different format. So people bring questions at the very beginning, because I actually really enjoy this um, kind of more, dy more dynamic since we have the Zoom uh, format. Maybe you can all bring questions or thoughts and, um, and we can all share and uh, have it a little bit more dynamic. Does that sound okay, Derek? Should I not be suggesting things before, <laughs> before asking you <laughs> ahead of time? Maybe I'm breaking some rule that I don't know, which... No, it sounds good. It's your session. You can choose how you want to do it. Okay, excellent. So let's do it that way um, uh, so that you have... Yeah, you can bring a few more... I mean, bring... You have... Uh, a month, I think, to think about <laughs> questions on gender, karma, and we can have a more kind of sort of open conversation. October 2nd is reminding me, Derek, Derek is reminding me, so great. Well, I think we can have the question and answer session continue on the 2nd of October then. And I want to thank you very much, Isoma, for this talk, which went in a completely different direction to what I expected. And I loved it. So thank you very much. <laughs> and also, please, everybody, feel free. And I encourage you to visit the emptycloud.org monastery website because there's lots of other very interesting things to see there and to find out more about the work of ISOMA and Empty Cow Monastery and Buddhist Insights. And for anybody who would like to, Kelly has been very busy in recent times at the monastery of Anukampa. And she has been cleaning and painting and helping with ordering new things. So anybody who would like to maybe order things for the monastery, there's a few things on the Amazon wish list, which I've just posted in the chat box. And these things are the things which we're sure Ayachanda would be happy to receive. And we're not at this moment in time wanting other things which are not on this list because we would like Venerable Chanda herself to choose what's in the monastery. So if it's on this list and you would like to donate, then we'd be very grateful. Thank you very much for having a look. And if you would like to come and participate in person with our community further, then the opportunity comes in November when Venerable Chandra will, will be back and Ajahn Brahm will be in the UK. 
and there are lots of spaces still available at these events. So please visit anucamperproject.org forward slash events. You can see a list of the events in London, Birmingham, Oxford and Stroud, where there's still tickets available. And it would be great to meet you in person if that's possible. So please have a look and also tell your friends and anybody else who you think might be interested. And I look forward to question and answers with ISOMA on the 2nd of October. So thank you very much everyone for being here. See you soon. See you soon.